Um, we're going to start a new theme this evening, a brand new theme. So approximately like three or four months, something like that, we have a, a theme that runs every week for Sangha Night. And um, this one I'm particularly excited about. It's a theme that I, I am interested in and excited in, and I hope you'll enjoy it as well. We're going to look at a, a, an aspect of the Buddhist tradition called mind training, the mind training tradition, or lojong as it's called in Tibetan. And um, we've got a kind of catchy subheading, which you probably can't see because it's so small on my flip on my um, PowerPoint, the alchemy of the emotions. So this evening I'm going to set the scene, I'm going to set the context of what is mind training and the alchemy of the emotions. So I'm going to set the scene and give you a bit of a flavour of what's to come in the coming weeks as part of this theme. Um, but I want to dedicate this evening's talk to um, a friend of ours, Dharma Parta, who passed away on Saturday. So Dharma Parta is a, an order member who's been, he's been in, in Sheffield for the last, last 14, 50 years, part of the order, ordained in 2007. His name is he who was protected by the Dharma. And I'm going to say a bit more about Dharma Parta in the talk this evening, because he's a really good example of what it can look like in daily life to, to practice the mind training tradition, the effect it had on him. I'll, I'll tell you more about Dharma Parta over the uh, course of the talk. But yeah, this, I want to dedicate the talk, maybe the theme, we could even dedicate the theme to Dharma Parta, because it's very much, um, he captures mind training and what that means. So, the theme is mind training or lojong in Tibetan. So what is that? What is mind training? Well, it's a set of very pithy practice instructions and they're intended to transform the way we think and act into the way that someone who had genuinely overcome the kind of sense of separate selfhood and the way they see the world and the way they behave. Um, in a sense, you could see this as playing at being like a bodhisattva. We're playing at being a bodhisattva and the ideal Buddhist so that we, could, we become more like a bodhisattva. So I've got the word up there, the bodhisattva ideal. I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means in a while, so if you've not come across that term before, I'll explain that. But you can see the mind training is playing at being a bodhisattva. It's a, it's a, it's a yeah, practice instructions to become like a bodhisattva. And as I said, I'm going to set the context this evening, just explain a bit about what this approach to Buddhist practice is about. Um, mind training is a really powerful and radical set of practices, and it's focused on transformation, and it's about transforming a number of things. First of all, negative emotions into positive emotions, into wisdom and into a really strong sense of connectedness with other people and the world around us. It's also about transforming our dukkha or suffering um, from something that cuts us off from others um, into transforming that into an experience that connects us with other people. And it's about transforming dukkha and suffering from something we, we wish to avoid transforming that into an opportunity where we can grow and develop. Um, and it's about transforming situations and events that we see as being bad and shouldn't be happening into valuable opportunities to practice and grow. So you can see it as a form of spiritual alchemy. So this is why we've got this title of the alchemy of the emotions. The ancient practice of alchemy is about transforming um, worthless base metals into gold, into priceless gold. And mind training is about transforming the kind of base, base metal of our negative emotions on everyday situation into, into priceless, valuable gold, spiritual gold. And in alchemy, to change base metal into gold, you, you, you need a crucible, an intense intensity, the intensity and heat of a crucible. And to really change spiritually, we need that intensity, we need a similar crucible, intense situation. And we get this in the crucible of a life that is really engaged with the world. Uh, yeah, the life that we, we lead. So this kind of approach to practice is really applicable to our modern lives, which are very engaged in the world, complex. So mind training is a way of practicing in, in the midst of a world that's busy, active, productive life, full of tasks, full of difficulties like ours. You know, it's, it's important to stress we also need to find opportunities for solitude, for retreats, for meditation, um, but if we think we can only practice when we're in these situations, then our opportunities to practice can be really limited. Um, so mind training is about making the whole of your life, the whole of your daily life, a crucible, an arena for practice. It's very powerful and very potent, mind training, but it's also, you can see it as very radical. Uh, mind training asks us to make some quite radical changes to how we see, how we view the world. 
So our attitudes, and some of the attitudes that it suggests you might find challenging, you might even find outrageous. You may be shocked, so just, just a warning, you might be shocked. And that's because mind training asks us to see the world through the eyes of a bodhisattva, the ideal, ideal Buddhist. Um, a, a Buddhist, a, a, a Bodhisattva is a person who is in the world, very much engaged in the world, but you could say they're not of the world, they're about, they're of, they're about something else. The ideal of the Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattva ideal, for me, is one of the most beautiful, is the most beautiful ideal for, for humanity, for human beings. And it's what made me, almost as soon as I heard it, want to commit, commit my life to the Buddhist path and to this, this ideal of trying to live, like, live by the ideal of the Bodhisattva. For me, it's, it's profoundly beautiful, and, and as soon as I heard about it, yeah, I wanted to live by it. And it's implicit in the, in the teachings and the life of the historical Buddha. So the way the Buddha taught, the way the Buddha lived, it, implicit in it was the Bodhisattva ideal. Um, but it became more explicit later on. Later traditions made it more explicit because they thought people had got a bit too caught up in selfishness. Yeah, and so the Buddha taught that our suffering is caused by obsession with ourselves, selfishness. And the Bodhisattva ideal bends a straw, you could say, completely the other way, and become, we become obsessed and concerned with other people, the welfare of other beings, all beings. And so the Bodhisattva ideal makes explicit the focus on compassion for others and altruism. That was very much implicit in the, in the life and the teachings of the historical Buddha. So the Bodhisattva is a being who is completely obsessed with enlightenment, with awakening. But not just for themselves, but for the, for the benefit of all beings. They want to benefit all beings through their practice. And they want everybody to, they see everybody, every being is having the potential to grow and become Buddhas. And they want that for all beings. They want to end suffering for all beings. They want everybody to become enlightened. And the Bodhisattva is driven by a force or a spirit, which you could, you could call the Bodhisattva spirit or, or a force, which is poetically said to take possession of their hearts and their minds. It's called the bodhicitta, um, the awakening heart. It could be translated as the awakening heart or the enlightened mind. So mind training, or sorry, yeah, the awakened heart, the enlightened mind, it arises, it takes possession of an individual, it arises within our own hearts or minds when the conditions are right. So you, you, may, you may remember that in Buddhism, everything arises in dependence on certain conditions. And if our mind is ethically tuned and sees the way sees the world the way a bodhisattva would see the world, then they, that's the condition for this, this spirit or force, this, this mind, this heart, to arise within us. And um, that's, that's why I practice, that's why I practice Buddhism. Um, so mind training is about training our mind so that the bodhicitta, the heart of the bodhisattva, can arise within us, so we can become a bodhisattva. That's what really mind training is about. It's about creating the internal conditions within our mind for that to arise. Um, for this bodhisattva attitude or spirit. But it's important to say it can be practiced at, all, at any level, basically. The principles underlying it apply to whatever level of experience or engagement with Buddhism you're at. So it's very, very practical, very, very transferable. <coughs> um, and hopefully, as, as we talk about it, you'll see, it's probably already familiar to you, the principles underlying my training are probably already familiar from the way we teach and practice in Sheffield. So the Bodhisattva spirit at the level we're currently at might mean becoming more generous, it might mean becoming more kind, just starting to become a bit more aware of the people around us and caring a bit more about them. That could be what the Bodhisattva spirit and mind training looks like for us in our situation. But the underlying principle is still the same. It's about working passionately to overcome the obstacles, our own kind of selfishness and becoming and our shortcomings and transforming our hearts and our minds. Um, yeah. At the same time, because our being moving outwards towards other people, our heart opening up to other people. So the, the principles are, are the same. So we're going to be looking at a particular text from the mind training tradition, the seven points of training the mind. And a commentary, it's basically, it's a, it's a really, really famous text and a really famous tradition. And it's, it's kind of ubiquitous throughout the whole of Tibetan Buddhism, especially. But you'll see it's really appropriate to, to us in the modern world as well in our, in our situation. We're going to be, particularly I'm going to be using a book called The Great Path of Awakening. Um, and it's a commentary by a Tibetan guy called Jamgon Kongchul from maybe 100, 200 years ago, but it's been translated. And that's the text that we're going to be looking at um, 
this version, seven points of training the mind, a great path of awakening. And I'm going to just, in a way, set the scene by looking at the first few verses of this text. And it begins by saying, homage to the great compassionate one. This elixir-like instruction is transmitted from Sir Lingpar. So what does that mean? What does it, so we're going we're gonna to enter into uh, a really, well, really exciting text, I think, and we're going to unpack it. So starting with these first few lines, uh, and then this evening we'll also look at another few lines as well in the course of this talk. So mind training is elixir-like because it's potent, and it, as I said, it transforms, it transforms the emotions. It's highly concentrated and highly effective. So in alchemy, the elixir was the medicine kind of potent medicine that would transform the, the base metal into gold. And, and so mind training is like this, it's elixir-like, it's potent, highly potent, highly effective. Homage to the great compassionate one um, refers to the, the Buddha, Avalok, the Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, which you may or may not have heard about, but he's a Bodhisattva figure related to compassion. So this, this instruction, the mind training, the seven-point mind training, is transmitted from Sir Lingfa. So who, who was Sir Lingfa? Who was Sir Lingfa? Sir Lingfa is a, a historical figure called Dharma Kirti. Sir Lingfa means he, part means he, he of the Golden Isle. And mind training is said to have originated with a man called Dharma Kirti who lived in Sumatra called the Golden Isle. And that's Indi what we currently know as Indonesia. And at the time, um, I think we're talking about kind of seven, eight hundred AD, something like that, our kind of common era. Um, Indonesia was a massive base of Buddhism in the world, it was huge. It was a centre of, of what if people who are more experienced will know as Mahayana Buddhism um, with the Bodhisattva idea, also Vajrayana Tantric Buddhism. Indonesia was a huge <coughs> kind of centre um, base of Buddhism at that time. And you might have seen some of the, the images that have been preserved from places like Borobudur, kind of just the, you know, the kind of sense of this, it was a very vast centre of Buddhism. Um, and the reason this tradition has spread um, and, and survived this tradition of mind training, it was transmitted from Sir Lingfa, but it was to, transmitted specifically to a, a, a great Buddhist practitioner called Atisha. I've forgotten to put, oh, I've, I've put Atisha's name there, I didn't forget. <laughs> Dharma Kirti and Atisha. So Dharma Kirti originates with him this whole approach to mind training from Indonesia, certainly in part. And, but it was transmitted to Atisha, and it was Atisha who was responsible for um, bringing it back to Tibet, where it spread, it really spread and flourished. So Atisha was born in Bengal in India, about 982 of our common era. And it's said, there's a legend about Atisha's life, it's, it's a kind of historical but also legendary figure as well. And um, it's said that while he was meditating, he was, he was a Buddhist uh, monk, while he was meditating, he had a vision Dharma Kirti in Indonesia, telling him to travel to Indonesia and study, study mind training. That's one version. Another version is that he just came across a leaf, a leaf of, um, of, of mind training instruction saying, be grateful to everybody. And it's some, something that kind of resonated and struck him and he knew he had to practice this. So whatever the, we don't know what the truth was, whatever happened, he, he decided to go and seek out Dharma Kirti and be tra trained in mind training. He undertook a long, hazardous sea voyage, and he spent 12 years as a disciple of Dharma Kirti, studying, training in Lojong, in mind training. And he returned back to India and became a really famous Buddhist figure in the time, a really famous figure in Buddhist history. He became the abbot of a great monastic university called Nalanda. We went, some of us have been on pilgrimage, we have pilgrimages every couple of years, every few years to northern India. And if you've ever been to Nalanda, you get the sense of what's, what's been excavated is vast remains of what was a huge monastic university, tens of thousands of monks living there, training and studying, and, and, Dharma, and uh, the teacher became the, the abbot, the head, the kind of head monk of this, um, this place in Ireland. Um, and his fame spread to Tibet. So some of you may be familiar with the, the legend of Padmasambha, who was said to have introduced Buddhism to Tibet around 700 AD. A couple of hundred years later, um, Tibet wasn't doing so well and Buddhism wasn't doing so well. And the king of Tibet at the time had heard about Atisha and he invited him several times to come, come to Tibet and re-establish re the Dharma in Tibet. And the stories say that, well, Atisha wasn't that keen really. Um, Tibet was quite a hazardous place, it was, it was quite a primitive place, dangerous place. 
Um, but also it was a long journey. He just, and he was kind of, he had quite a kind of comfortable life. He was the head of this great university, a very famous figure. He wasn't really attracted to the idea of going to Tibet and trying to re-establish the Dharma, which would be a really difficult thing to do. But it said that he had another vision, he had another dream or vision, at this time of Green Tara, the, uh, the Bodhisatt another Bodhisattva of compassion. And it said that Green Tara appeared to him and told him that if he went to Tibet and introduced um, the Dharma and mind training into Tibet, it would greatly benefit the world. But Green Tara also is said to have told a teacher it would shorten his life by 15 years if he went to Tibet. So it left him with a bit of a dilemma, you know, a difficult um, decision to make, shorten his own life, but benefit many, many beings. And um, yeah, I mean, the good news for us is that Atisha decided to go to Tibet and introduce the Dharma, introduce mind training, and at the cost of his own life. He died at the age of 72, but he, he passed on the mind training teachings to his disciples orally at first, um, and a new school of Buddhism was, was established, the Kadampa school. Uh, with some very, very famous, important disciples. And it was lucky for us that Atisha did this, because shortly after he, he travelled to Tibet, and there was a Muslim invasion of India and Indonesia, and Buddhism was wiped out, basically. It completely wiped out in India and Indonesia, but survived in Tibet, and largely through Atisha taking um, Buddhism over there, and other figures as well. So that's the backstory. story, really. That is the... Um, the story of how the mind training tradition originated and was transmitted and is captured in these kind of first few, few lines of the text. But there's a guy called Chekawa who um, maybe a couple of hundred years later, hundred, a couple of hundred years later after a teacher, kind of condensed it. It had been an oral tradition that was passed down, but he condensed it into a, a set of written verses called the seven points of training the mind. But this was, um, yeah, if you look at it, probably about a thousand AD, this was composed, the seven points of training the mind. And then it, become, it, it was spread throughout the whole of Tibetan Buddhism, many schools of Tibetan Buddhism, but became very, very important. And it's this text, the seven points of training the mind, that we're going to be, we're going to be looking at the next few weeks. Okay, so let's look at some more, some more lines. So the next set of lines I'll be looking at this evening is, know the meaning of this text, and the five defilements will be turned into the path to enlightenment. Know the meaning of this text, and the five defilements will be turned into the path to enlightenment. As you look at it, I'm just going to get a clock to make sure I don't talk for too long. <laughs> so the five defilements, also known as the five kleshas, uh, the five poisons. And the klesha can mean something that torments or defiles the mind. Um, Sangharach just described the Klesha as a, a kind of ego-centered restlessness in the mind. Our mind is made restless by selfishness in a way. So if there are poisons in the five kind of emotions, attitudes, states of the mind, are poison, poisonous. And this is what this is the mind that needs to be trained. This is the mind that needs to be transformed into the, the mind of the Bodhisattva. So the five poisons are greed. I imagine we're all very familiar with the five poisons, so I might not need to say too much about them. <coughs> Um, in a way, they're all like the way in which our kind of our ego, our sense of separateness and fixedness, <coughs> tries to kind of reinforce itself and cut itself off, isolate ourselves from from the rest of reality and other people. So greed, we want things to make us, we want to consume and own to make ourselves feel bigger and more important and, and, and happier at the expense of other people. If anything gets in the way of that, we want to destroy it. We hate it. Um, and there's a deliberate turning away from the way things are. We, want, we avoid, we stick our heads in the sand. When, when reality kind of goes against our idea of being cut off and separate from the world, we're not interested, so we bury our head in the sands and we might distract ourselves. It's, we, we, the, so ignorance and avoidance, it's a tendency to, to not look at, the, at reality, the inconvenient truths of reality. And then there's envy, you know, the, and envy and pride. This is, you know, again, related to seeing ourselves in competition with other people around us. It's, and in a way, all the, these 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 places, these defilements are poisoning us from other people and from, from our own happiness in a way. So we want to transform them, we need to transform them, the five poisons. And Atisha and um, Chekhova are saying to us, well, these five poisons um, can be turned into the path to enlightenment, the path to liberation. So our mind is poisoned by these, these five poisons, and the mind we're trying to cultivate is the bodhisattva mind, the bodhisattva heart. So an example of what that might look like. So 
a bodhisattva, we're trying to train, transform that greed into generosity, wanting to give, rather than wanting to take and get, or wanting to transform that and wanting to give, to be generous. Um, that hatred towards the world and the people into metta, into loving kindness, compassion. And that avoidance, not wanting to look at the inconvenient truths into mindfulness, seeing directly and looking at our experience and reality. So we're trying to train our mind away from these five poisons into the heart and mind of a bodhisattva. Yeah, and this is good news, this is good news, this point about the, these, these five poisons becoming our path to enlightenment is good news because you might have a sense of, well, you know, I can't practice, my mind is so overcome with these negative states, I can't practice, I can't be a proper Buddhist, or my life is so difficult, there's so many obstacles in my life, I can't commit to the Buddhist path. Actually, the opposite is true. What, what this mind training text is saying is this is the practice, this is the arena for practice. And um, yeah, these mental states can be turned into the path of, to enlightenment. In a sense, they must be, it must be, because we can, only, we can only apply the antidote to the poison when the poison has arisen, when the poison's there in our minds. But so situations in our complex lives where we find ourselves becoming jealous, becoming angry, experiencing craving, that's when we can practice, that's when we can apply the antidote. So it's in the midst of our busy lives and the complex day-to-day -day situations we can transform these poisons into the path of liberation. So this is good news. Um, and it might be actually we've kind of, we tended to deliberately avoid situations where we experience these, these states. But mind training is saying, well, we don't, have, we don't need to avoid these situations. We can, we can transform ourselves, our mind, in, these, in the midst of these situations. So over the coming weeks, we'll hear more about how, how we can do that. Yeah. In a way, we need to learn to see our, our, our reactions and situations and, as being an opportunity to practice. And I'll say more about that. But one important way that we do this is around our experience of dukkha, or unsatisfactoriness. Um, yeah, so how can we transform these poisons? Well, we're going we're gonna to face, we're going to come face to face with these poisons, these, these negative states usually when we experience dukkha or discomfort or unsatisfactoriness. So you may or may not be familiar with this word dukkha, but it's a very important concept and word in, in Buddhism. Um, dukkha often gets translated as suffering, probably more, um, a better translation might be unsatisfactoriness, but it's a bit of a clumsy word. But it's a general sense that, well actually an image that often goes with dukkha is the image of a, a wheel which doesn't quite fit properly. So in the time of the Buddha, it would be a cart or a kind of chariot with a wheel that doesn't fit properly. So you get the sense the whole of your, it might, it might be a flat tire in a kind of, might be a more, more kind of modern analogy. <laughs> or so like a, a, a shoe with a stone in it might be another analogy. Essentially, you've got, you're traveling on a journey through life and no matter how beautiful the landscape might be, there's always an element of discomfort if, if the wheel doesn't fit right or you've got a kind of stone in your shoe. So this is the sense in, in, in Buddhism that our experience is going to have an element of discomfort or unsatisfactoriness in it. And um, mind training says, actually, we can turn this, this, we can use that rather than being cheesed off about that, that kind of fact of life, we can actually turn it into a way of tra transforming, of growing. We can, we can use that as an opportunity. So what, let's look a bit more at the um, at Dukkha and how we can use Dukkha as a way of practicing it. So my name is Bodhi Naga, by the way, I've done this in the <laughs> <laughs> Go back to the start, my name is Bodhi Naga. <laughs> I'm giving the talk. <laughs> um, so you might recognise this from the introductory course. It's the simplified wheel of life that we use on week two. When we talk about our habitual responses to, to Dukkha, actually, we, we simplify this in, in this way. Hopefully you can see that up there. And I'm going to just revisit this um, to explore how, how, we, how we respond to Dukkha and how we can transform those situations of Dukkha into the path of practice. Um, so our, what, you know, in, in, this, in this simplified model that we're used to, we get a feeling which is often has an element of discomfort to it. And we have a habitual response to it, which kind of creates a wheel, a wheel of suffering that we get bound to, we get tied to. It's, often, it's interesting how often this, this analogy or this image of the wheel comes up in, in relation to, to this, this pattern of karma and, and suffering. But yeah, we've got the wheel of life, this wheel of suffering that we, we create for ourselves. 
And our usual response to the, to the clashes, um, or, or sorry, our usual response to duck is that our mind becomes poisoned by the clashes. It becomes poisoned by craving or desire to distract ourselves and not look, or anger or hatred or blame. Um, and yeah, so we either go into kind of blaming the world or we look to distract ourselves from discomfort. Often Dukkha as well makes us retreat into our shell a bit, cuts us off from the world. Um, but mind training advises us to let go of blame, um, to experience Dukkha, accept Dukkha and experience Dukkha, and use it as a way to connect with other people rather than being cut off and isolated from people. We can use our Dukkha to connect with other people around us because we all suffer, every being suffers, and we can use our, our own suffering to connect um, with compassion for, for all beings. Yeah, and I just mentioned again Dharma Parata's picture has gone from before, but Dharma Parata uh, is yeah, a good friend of mine and um, he really typifies this approach of using Dukkha to transform, using the experience of Dukkha to transform. As long as I knew him, which was about 15 years, he had a condition called pulmonary hypertension, um, which meant he, um, he was really ill basically. I kind of, um, he, his um, lungs didn't work very well, he had kind of problems with his heart. Um, but he never complained. Like the, he, he, and he, he all, yeah, I talk more about him. But he's somebody who dealt impeccably with suffering. It kind of the suffering didn't define him. Um, it wasn't about who he was. He, he was um, a very, very inspiring person for me. Just kind of, he, he, yeah, he always had a tremendous amount of physical suffering, but he didn't, um, he didn't let that define him or kind of, um, yeah, affect how he responded to the world. So I'll talk more about Dharma part in a little while. But I just wanted to give him another mention there. Um, in a way, he was able to use the situation of Dukkha to, to cultivate these really qualities of patience, um, courage, bravery, and, and cheerfulness in the face of his suffering. Um, but also a heart that was impeccably, sorry, an, an, an un, um, a really, really warm heart, really kind, caring heart. Um, so, yeah, he's, I'll talk more about him later, but an example of a man who um, was able to use suffering to, com to cultivate this really warm, compassionate heart. Let's look a bit more at Dukkha and how we might usually respond to Dukkha and how that gets us caught up in the, the wheel of life. So there's a traditional list of three types of Dukkha. There's diff you know, it, when, the more you get used to Buddhism, there's lots of different lists. You might have kind of got the hang of this already, but um, there's, you know, I looked, yeah, there's different lists of Dukkha that you could use, but this is one particular uh, list, three types of Dukkha. Um, so the first type of Dukkha is just, we might be called Dukkha Dukkha. <laughs> Basically, it's just a straightforward Dukkha. Um, it just, you know, stuff happens and it's painful. And usually for me, it might involve the body. So um, you get sick, you get sciatica, you stub your toe, um, you bang into something, you get you know, backache, whatever, you know, some, something unpleasant happens. It might be, it might be other things, you might, you know, bump your car, your child might vomit all over you, which sometimes happens to me. Um, you know, other things that I could talk about. <laughs> um, basic, yeah, and the Buddha talked about different types of physical pain, but he talked about birth as being suffering. You know, it's suffering for the mother, it's suffering for the child. Um, it was suffering for me watching when my children were born. Um, I fainted quite a lot when my, when my children were born. Um, Old age, the Buddha talked about old age being suffering, suffering of old age, which again I'm starting to see with, with friends of mine who, um, it's not fun, getting old isn't fun. Um, the body doesn't work as well as discomfort and faculties start to go. There's the, the, the suffering of, of sickness, which we will all experience, and then eventually the suffering of death. Um, and yeah, I've, I've observed Dharma Pah to go through each of these kind of types of Dukkha Dukkha and just deal with it impeccably. It's, it's possible to deal with it impeccably. But often we all will react by blaming, wanting to kind of blame the world around us, blame other people, um, or go into craving, anger, resentment. And that's the kind of typical way we might, we might deal with, with that kind of dukkha. There's also what you might call psychological dukkha. And this comes from really, I, I'm kind of going to summarise this as it's not really understanding the way the world works. So we don't understand dukkha is one of the three marks of conditioned experience, but there's also impermanence. And, and that man, the fact that we're kind of deeply connected with the world around us. So the implications are that everything's changing all the time and we're not in control of it. Basically, you could summarise it like that. And through not really understanding that, we cause ourselves dukkha. Um, yeah, so we look for things outside of us to give us pleasure, but they're constantly changing or, or might let us down. 
we might get bored with them, our possessions break, they wear out, or we want something else. Um, sensory pleasures just over like that in an instant. Just the impermanence means we can't hold on to them. They can't give us a lasting pleasure. We might get everything, we might seek and get everything we want, the right job, the right romance, the right house, but something will change and it's constantly, constantly changing, it's bound to change. Um, and in terms of the wheel of life, our experience is constantly changing and it brings us into contact with, you know, there's different experiences we're experiencing all the time and they have different, a kind of different flavour to them, but we're going to come into contact with things we don't like. The Buddha talked about, well, we come into contact with things we don't like and this is where we've got the, the sad face, the unhappy face. Um, there might be people we don't like, we come into contact with work, our work we might not like, a full dishwasher in the tea room or something like that. You, can, you basically encounter lots of different things all the time and they're, they're unpleasant, we don't want them. All the cake is gone, all, all the baked potatoes are gone. You know, this is kind of like some um, small examples. But yeah, all the time we're, we're getting into contact with things that we don't like. We're also being separated from things that we do like, um, which leads to craving, there's frustration, resentment, so another um, unhappy face situation. But then even when we do get pleasurable situations that we want, there's a, 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 a Buddhist scholar called Edward Conza talked about, there's a, con, a concealed suffering in, involved with our pleasure. So often there might be a sense of our pleasure is coming at the expense of other people or other beings. So we might be tucking into a really nice juicy steak, but you know, the back of our mind, this, you know, that steak's come from a, a living being and there's going to be an, an anxiety and an ease around that. Or we might be able to buy or, um, I know, a, a, a nice, um, cheap, fashionable clothing, but it's come at the expense of people who've made it, who you know, have been paid low wages. So in a sense, there might be pleasure that we're experiencing which is tied into suffering for the people, and there's an unease around that. Maybe you know, there's experience of this around politics and power, um, business, where there's a sense where there's a fear of losing, losing the thing that we've got that we really want, so there's a fear involved in losing it. This might also come with um, you know, possessions, houses, cars, partners, there's a fear and anxiety involved in, in losing them, so there's a pleasure bound up with some discomfort and, and suffering. And the, the, the Buddhist tradition also gives, also gives the example of where there's pleasure which is tied into to suffering, so um, the body is a good example of this, you know, you can use the body for pleasure, we can have chocolate, we can have sex, they uh, fun things, we enjoy that, but you can also get, um, as a you know, migraines, you can get sciatica, period pain, apparently I've never had that. <laughs> So, you know, you get, you get tied into this pleasurable, you know, pleasure tied into pleasure is inevitable suffering as well. The kind of two, two come together. But the psychological suffering comes from, in a way, not really accepting this, not really understanding this properly. So we fight against it, we fight against the kind of inevitable suffering that we experience. And the Buddha talked about um, an analogy of there being two arrows. He said, imagine that you've been shot by an arrow, which is unpleasant, a very unpleasant situation. <laughs> um, but it says, the Buddha described our response to being shot by an arrow in this kind of hypothetical situation. The sensible thing would be to pull the arrow out, but the Buddha said, what we do instead is we get a second arrow and stab it into the wound. And this is, might sound like a really shocking analogy, but in a way what the Buddha is describing is our response to the things that happen makes them a lot worse. We end up piling the lo loads of more suffering on top of whatever's actually happening. We create a second arrow on top of the ducker that's already there. So there might be a migraine, or I don't know, or a bad back, or whatever, the, the thing that we're experiencing, the ducker that we're experiencing, but we had a whole load of extra, the ducker ducker's there, but we had a whole load of extra psychological ducker on top of it. We stick an extra arrow into the wound. So it might be stories like, this isn't fair, which in a way, doesn't really do it well, it doesn't make it just makes the suffering worse. Or I can't cope with this, or this is never going to end. We just kind of heap lots of more suffering on top of the, the dukkha dukkha that's in a way unavoidable. We might even be stabbing ourselves with second arrows before the first arrow has arisen. So there's the anticipation of things that might happen and the fear, the anxiety of things which haven't actually happened, but we're kind of creating this psychological suffering for ourselves, living out. Um, things are from the past over and over again. We're kind of, yeah, we're creating a lot of suffering for ourselves, psychological dukkha. So the example I might use for this is, is um, Christmas. Yeah, Christmas <laughs> has just happened, and um, Christmas at home is in a situation where I get, you know, I come into contact with things that I don't like. Um, in a way, 
family, I suppose. It's kind of this. <laughs> um, I, I, dearly, I dearly love, I, and I love my family, my, my in-laws, my relations. Deal, deal, I do love them very much. At the same time, I dislike them as well. And um, spending, spending that time together um, pushes buttons. You know, I'm coming up against reactions, anger, um, yeah, frustration, resentment, and, and so it's a, it's a brilliant opportunity to practice mind training, actually, which is what you know what I was doing over the over the Christmas period, and they're just kind of taking responsibility for that. But in a way, um, this is the kind of psychological um, situation that I thought came to mind today. Just like you know, you're you're in a situation which is happening, and um, you make it worse with stories about how you don't want it to be happening, you want it to be different, and it just you just create a scenario where you suffer when you don't need to suffer. We'll be exploring that a lot more in the coming weeks around my training, but yeah, it's, it's an example of psychological, psychological dukkha. And the third level of dukkha that Edward Conza talks about is what we could call existential dukkha. Um, yeah, so even if we could control the world, which we can't, but even if we could control the world, so we got everything lined up we wanted and it wasn't going to change, so we'd get the perfect partner, the perfect job, the right romance, the right house, everything, the right gadgets, and it wasn't going to change, which is impossible. But if it wasn't, and we could do that, we still wouldn't be happy, we still wouldn't be satisfied, there would still be dukkha. And this dukkha is an existential dukkha. It comes from the fact that, um, you, might, you might describe it as there's a bit of us longs for something more, a bit of us long, is longing to grow, to awaken, to fulfil our, our kind of deepest potential. And until we're really doing that, until we're really activating that and living out of our deepest potential for Buddhahood, for awakening, there's going to be a, an inner sense of lack, lack of emptiness, a sense that life is about something, something's missing in life. So they're going to be, you know, if our life could seem perfect in a worldly sense, but we'd still suffer. And that's because, um, yeah, lasting satisfaction and fulfillment comes from um, living by something deeply valuable, you know, living a Dharma life, a spiritual life. So yeah, we can only be really kind of deeply, even permanently satisfied by living in accord with our deepest values, fulfilling our deepest potential, and responding to this urge within us to grow, to awaken, which I imagine you've all experienced because you, you've come here and you're engaging with, with the Dharma life. So this brief tour of Dukkha, um, hopefully you can see, well in a way it's inevitable, we are going to, you know, there's going to be discomfort and, and suffering in our life, it's inevitable. And you know, we'll see over the coming weeks, mind training prepares us and, and deals with this, it helps us to deal with the dukkha in our lives. We've got a fragile body, everything's changing around us, there's this existential dukkha. Um, and if we make our happiness de dependent on outer things, we're going to be constantly frustrated and, and dissatisfied. And it's our response to this dukkha though, this is the crucial point in the Dharma life, this is where the arena for practice, this is kind of the intense crucible for mind training, it's how we respond to dukkha in our life. This is what either will make or break us really. And um, yeah, Sangha actually to the founder of our tradition, I was reading some, th some things he wrote about dukkha this morning, and he talked about um, dukkha represents the point of intersection of two different orders of reaction. It's the point of choice and decision. A choice, moreover, that confronts us not on two or three momentous occasions only, but every instant of our lives. So Zango actually is saying we're confronted with a choice, a decision that we can make in every instant, every moment of our lives, we've got a choice. We can respond to the duck in our, our experience one of two ways. And again, you'll be familiar with this. If you look at the diagram of the Wheel of Life, our habitual response to Dukkha is just to do the same thing, to act, to react. We get poisoned by anger, we get poisoned by craving. I mean, we react in a way of either blaming the world, blaming other people for our dukkha, or we try and distract ourselves from it. And we end up just creating more and more suffering for ourselves in the future. We deepen the kind of karmic responses and we create more and more suffering for ourselves in the future. So often, as I said, our usual response to dukkha is to, is to look to blame, seek to blame, um, or to kind of pretend it's not happened, try and distract ourselves from it. But mind training encourages us, it challenges us to let go of blame and to, as I said earlier, experience the dukkha. Use it as a way to connect to other people. And suffering, you know, instead of using suffering to act in the, the old habitual way, that, that experience of suffering can be a doorway, a, an opportunity to step into a different way of being.
Yeah, there's a different response to suffering. Suffering can wake us up to, to what's really important in our lives. You may have had this experience of, of quite strong suffering in your life, but suddenly things have become clear. Priorities have become clear. You may be bereavement, it may be loss, it may be other types of suffering, but suddenly there's a kind of a clarity and a priority. Suffering can turn us into a different, a different response. And the response, the traditional word for this in, in Buddhism is called shraddha, which can be translated as faith, but it's probably better confidence or conviction. You've got a conviction, and it could be an urge, a longing, an, an intuition that more is possible, a different way is possible. So you seek to respond differently. Yeah, so instead of reacting in the same way, we can act creatively. We can, we can respond differently to dukkha. And um, we, can change, we can change ourselves and our mind and our, our habits. We can become different. So this is, this is the area of mind training. It's how we respond in the moment to dukkha. And training our mind, instead of going through the same patterns, but training our mind to respond differently. So I guess you know, some of this you'll recognise, some of this is going to be familiar. And you'll be very familiar with our teaching on the gap. Anyway, the gap is what makes this possible. If you're, in, if you're in the moment, if you're experiencing dukkha, what makes that decision or that choice possible is awareness, mindfulness, which creates the gap where we've got this, this choice um, between our, our usual response, our impulsive response, and, and a different way of responding, a creative response, which will create less suffering and a better future. And it may be actually you notice the gap after it's, after it's happened, but there's still awareness that it might be you notice you could have done something differently, but you can reflect on that and you can notice where the gap might be possible the next time this, this pattern comes round. So what we need to do, if, if we're going to be in the gap and respond differently to Dukkha and train our mind to respond differently to Dukkha, what we need to do is become, um, we become friends with our reactions in a way. We need to start to look for, pay attention, and notice when we're reacting to dukkha in an unhelpful and an unskillful way, when our minds becoming poisoned, and I, I guess this is a good analogy because if you actually if you take if you consume poison, presumably by mistake, you get some kind of food poisoning. You get, there's a response in your body; you can feel it in your body. It's a very strong response to the poison, and the same is true of, of these emotional poisons. Actually, you can feel them in your body. You can feel you know your body tensing up when you you become poisoned by hang, anger or hatred. Um, there's a kind of saliva in the mouth and your, body, your mind's become poisoned by craving. Um, I was listening to a talk by Sabuta, he described, um, oh, you can feel, notice your bowels loosening when your mind's poisoned by fear, or kind of the, the response to flee and fight. <laughs> so we have physical responses, we have a physical response to our inner reactions, our, our emotions. So if, you're, if you notice in your body you're beginning to get angry, you can feel the steam building up between your ears and it's about to blow out. And you can notice that physical reaction and you're being poisoned by your response to Dukkha. But you can feel that reaction in your body and, and you can do something about it. Um, your mind might to think you're really angry with a particular person. Well, you can think, actually, this person has given me an opportunity to practice, an opportunity to apply an antidote to my anger or my, my hatred, to transform it into the gold of, of, uh, of metta, of love. Yeah, so the first and most important thing is, is to stop blaming the world for our reactions and to take responsibility for our own mind, our own emotions. You know, no one else can make us feel angry or hatred or frustrated or hate, uh, feel hate or frustrated or envious or jealous. We do that. It's our response, it's our mind. So we need to take responsibility for our, our minds and our, our responses and then we can change and then we can transform them. So that's the beginning of mind training. The beginning of mind training is noticing your responses, your reactions. And this is the basis, this becomes the basis for practice. And you don't, the great thing is you don't need any special equipment, you don't need any expensive equipment. Basically you just need your own mind and other people. That's all you need in mindfulness. And then you'll notice your reactions, you'll notice the poisons, and you can start to transform them. So if you understand the meaning of the text, then the five poisons become the path to, to freedom. You can, they become the antidote. That, you, know, you can apply the antidote and become free of them. Yeah. So, you can, so Sabuti said you could learn to love your reactions. And by this, it doesn't mean love them and do them more. But it's kind of <laughs> see them, see them as, the, as, as a clue. You can, ah, this is a reaction. I can change this. And so you can start to become interested, excited, curious about your, your mind and how it responds and how you can change that. 
Um, and then you start to get a flavour of the transformation. You can notice that you can, you can really take charge, you can take control of your, your mind and your responses and, and create something very, very beautiful, actually, very, very different to what it started out with. The base metal can really be transmuted into gold, actually, the gold of um, spiritual positive emotions. Yeah, you might remember on the six week course, we talk about, we have this analogy of, of life being like a river. So it's your, it's, it's, and I was meditating earlier this, this evening and just experience, had this sense of my experience just being like a river flowing through. Constantly I'm presented with different experiences and I'm presented with kind of impulsive reactions. Just, it seems like just this river of experience flowing through, just constantly changing experience, constantly changing reactions and impulses. And we, t we talk about on the intro course that it's a bit like a rapid to start with. You get buffeted around by reactions. You don't re even really know what's happening. You're just kind of bashed around by these kind of rapids of experience and reactions. But with meditation and mindfulness, which you can apply mindfulness moment to moment, it starts to slow down and your reactions and your experiences start to slow down. You can start to notice the gap more. You can notice the dukkha. You can notice your response to the dukkha. You can notice your mind being poisoned and you can notice an opportunity to do something about it. But this, this analogy of the river can go fur, fur, further than that because you can start to redirect the flow of the river. You can start to change it. You can start to produce a river that flows in a completely different direction. Emotions that flow in a different direction respond in a different direction. So you can start, and this is the Metta Bhavna as well, is the arena for this, the practice of the Metta Bhavna. You're just carving out new channels for your emotions to flow down. The Buddha used the analogy of irrigation, that a, a spiritual practitioner is irrigating their mind. So we've got this, these traditional, maybe lifelong, um, habitual ways that our emotions respond. But we, we've got the choice through meditation, mind training, ethics, to carve out different responses, a different direction for our emotions to flow in. Okay. And there's a verse from Shantideva. So you'll hear... If you hear me talk, you'll often hear me talk about Shantideva. He's, he's a very important, um, from a similar period of, of, from a teacher actually, but he, he composed a text called the, the Guide to the Buddhist Path, the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. And it's, it's, it's a, basically it's a mind training text as well. But he, there's a verse from that which has basically stuck with me the whole of my Buddhist life, which I'll share with you. And Shantideva says that um, if you tame your mind, you tame all threats and problems. He says, all fear and suffering come from the mind. And he uses the analogy that you can't cover the whole world in leather to make your feet soft and comfortable, but you can wear a pair of shoes and that has the same effect, basically. That's kind of paraphrasing what Shantideva says, but you know what, you can't control the world around you and your experiences that get presented to you of dukkha, but what you can control is your mind and how you respond to them. And that, in a way, takes away the whole, the whole psychological dukkha, existential dukkha, is taken away. Um, you can control your, your mind, and your mind is really what comes into contact with the world. So you, you, can't, you, know, you can't cushion the paper over and control. We're trying to do this. We try and stop any experience of dukkha by controlling the world. And it's much better to try and control your own mind. And that's the one thing you can have control over. So mind training challenges us to tame our minds, take control of our minds. And it challenges us to see that most of our suffering comes from our own mind. Uh, what we call ego cleaning. Um, and instead we can use adverse situations as opportunities to let go of ego clinging, to, to completely become free of it, to become liberated. And this is the area that Padaya is going to talk about next, next week. We can see these difficult situations we find as opportunities to practice in. Um, yeah, so we're going to, throughout the course of this theme, we're going to do something a bit different, which, which kind of ties in with what we do on the 12-week course, the two six-week courses. We're going to suggest some homework each week. So um, there's some suggested homework for the week ahead, which relates to dukkha and discomfort and the gap. So the suggestion is, could you set a specific time this week to, to, do, to do nothing at all? Just set aside a specific time, it might be every day or once, a week, once in your week, to do nothing at all. And if, if what is your reaction to, to any discomfort, you might find it easy, but a lot of people find this incredibly uncomfortable, just to sit and not do anything for half an hour, 20 minutes. Um, just notice your reaction to any discomfort. Is it blame? Are you going to blame Bodhinaga for making you do this? Um, or do you want to go into distraction and get your phone out or turn the telly on or whatever it is or look at your emails? Can you just do nothing and just see what your reaction 
your mind does in, the, in relation to that discomfort. And then more generally, notice how you might habitually react to discomfort or pain or inconvenience during the week. And try and be in the gap if you can. Um, yeah, so this is like setting us up for kind of the context of mind training. Just looking at how we respond to dukkha and discomfort. Can we be in the gap in relation to it? Can we start to notice what our mind tends to do when we experience dukkha? And I want to end just by, again, just talking about uh, my friend Dharma Palata. So I'm going to go back to his picture. Look like Dharma Palata, he who is protected by the Dharma. Um, yeah, Sabuti in the talk, he gave a talk in, in India about mind training, which I really enjoyed. And he, talked, he said basically mind training is the essence of the Dharma. Moment by moment, trying to change your mind using any situation, but especially difficult situations, as opportunities to practice. And Sabuti says, I can guarantee you that even some engagement with this point of view will very much change your experience of life. And, um, you yeah, know, in a way, the whole of the Dharma, the essence of the Dharma, is captured in mind training. And hopefully we'll see that over the, the weeks to come. Um, but Dharma Pada is someone who, who, who engaged with mind training, he practiced mind training as, as, as well as other practices. And you could really see the effect it had on him, like I said earlier. He experienced a lot of physical suffering, a lot of dukkha dukkha through his um, pulmonary hypertension, which he had for many, many years. But he never, he never seemed to really be diminished by it or defined by it. It was just something that kind of was happening to his body, but it wasn't really who he was. His, his kind of consciousness, his, his being was much, much bigger than that kind of discomfort that was going on at the time. And there's this mind training packs in a lot into it. It's very condensed. It uses meditations. It uses slogans, as we'll find out. It uses um, wisdom teachings. Um, it uses something called the five forces, which we'll hear about. But there's a particular, there's slogans, and, uh, and I wanted to give you a, just a taste of what a particular mind training slogan. So there's one, that, one slogan that you'll, come, you'll encounter, which says, always have the support of a cheerful mind. This is one of the slogans of mind training. Always have the support of a cheerful mind. And this really encapsulated Dharma Palata for me, that he was always cheerful, no matter what experience was going on in his life, whether it was um, breathlessness, nausea, infection, um, you know, being tangled up in lots of different wires and cables that he had to wear to help him stay alive. Um, he just took it all in his stride, really, with cheerfulness. He always had the support of a cheerful mind. And that, that's really a, a challenge to me and um, probably to others who knew him, who kind of, we can get caught up in the dukkha, the day-to-day dukkha of our lives and become kind of bogged down by it. But actually, it's possible to always maintain the support of a cheerful mind. And that meant that, you know, what Dharma Pata was doing, he was cutting through the second arrow. He just had the dukkha, dukkha. And that was manageable. Dukkha, dukkha is manageable. But if you start to add on other layers of dukkha, psychological um, suffering and stories, it becomes unmanageable. And a lot of us can fall into that. But it's possible to, to cut through that. And um, yeah, this, this Dharma Pata always maintaining a cheerful um, mind meant that he was available for other people. He, had, he was able to really engage with the, the difficulty, the adversity in his experience and cultivate, as I mentioned earlier, a heart that was full of care and kindness and, and love and compassion. It really seemed to kind of shine out of him, this cheerfulness and this, this care for the people, despite you know, some really difficult suffering. So his, his name that we've got given to him was he who was protected by the Dharma. And this was really applicable to Dharma Palata because it was, his mind was protected by mind training in the Dharma. Because he could have gone, you know, he could have spiralled into kind of you know, really negative states with the, the suffering he experienced, but he, instead he used it to transform, to protect and transform his mind. And he radically changed from the kind of, the man who came across, came to the Buddhist Centre with a very, very colourful um, past, suddenly became transformed over the next 15 years into somebody with a heart, you know, full of patience and courage and love and kindness. So you can turn adversity and suffering into a, into a path of practice. Yeah, so he was an alchemist, Dharma Palata was an alchemist. He transmuted the base metal of his, his mind and emotions into the gold, spiritual gold of love and kindness and care and courage and patience. So I want to end the talk, not with applause for, for me in the talk, which is sometimes what we would do, but let's end by applauding Dharma Palata and end with applause for Dharma Palata.